Good morning. Let's see if you can wait maybe 30 seconds, people filing in. It's kind of, kind of early. For, for those of you who were, there was a, there was a party yesterday, and, and so maybe, maybe everyone is um, still trying to wake up. Let's go and get, let's go and get started. Um, my name is Ralph Krohn. Um, hello. Uh, I lead the design team at Surface, and today, um, this morning, I want to talk a little bit about uh, product making. So that's, that's my... Uh, that's my session. I think outside it says design matters, but I think what we've done is the way we think about making products is, or the way we think about design is putting design in the larger context of product making. And, and that's, uh, that's, that's my, my talk. And to kind of get warmed up a little bit, I want to share this image here. I put it on this morning because I was thinking um, there's, uh, when this is the 19, 74 VW Golf was sold here as the, the rabbit. And this was in 1974, I was six years old. So I grew up in Germany, as you um, can hear my accent. Uh, I also grew up in the city uh, of Wolfsburg, which is the headquarter of VW. So my, everyone I knew in my family worked at VW. And, and one of the advantages is that you get a car to a discount back then. And every year we had a new car. And then after a year, we would sell it for a little bit of profit if you take care of it and so on. And so we would have Beatles, VW Beetle. And we would, you know, as in Germany, they have long summer vacations. And, and every, every summer, we would take the rear seat out, um, put luggage in, a tent, and then an inflatable mattress. And that's, what, that's where I would be on. There were no seat belts back then. And then we would, take, uh, then we would drive to Spain, usually for 17, 20 hours, and then stay there, you know, for three weeks and coming back. So going, going on vacation was a big thing. And, and, then the, and then the VW Golf, or the Rabbit, how it's called here, came out, and it was so different. It, the engine was in the front. It was designed by an um, Italian guy, uh, Giugiaro, uh, of Ital Design. And, and, and one of the things that this car did was, you know, uh, it had roughly the same size as the as the as the as the Beetle, but you could flip flip the rear seats over, and then you could turn the rear seats into a huge trunk, and you could go to the, you know, German Home Depot and get your get your paint buckets, or you could go on vacation, and and you could do all kinds of things. So it was a radical shift from it wasn't air cooled, it was water cooled. The engine was in the front. There was a you know front wheel drive, not a rear wheel drive. And and as a kid, I would sit. Um, you know, in family gatherings, and everyone would talk about cars. And this was this huge discussion and debate, and people thought, oh, it was ugly because it didn't look like the Beetle, and, and then and, and, and all these things. And the first generation, um, they came out with disk drives if you bought a GTI, and, and they would squeak. You know, you would come to a stop at a, at a stoplight, and they would squeak, and there were big, you know, big complaints about this. And then, and then a year later, people bought the car, and then two years, three years later, it was very popular, and it, and, and it became the number one car in Germany, and, it, and it's inspiring to me because uh, these guys back then, you know, there were car categories, and they came up with this car, and it was a radical shift. It, you know, they invented a new category, you know, there was a, it was a hatchback, com, you know, a compact car that you could transform and, and adjust to your needs, and, and when I look at design, it's, uh, you know, Many people think our design is making things beautiful. I think a beautiful product is a result of you know, thinking about stuff you know, maybe deeper than just the skin level. And this is a great inspiration for me because we, uh, this car changed how people uh, interacted with the car. And, and whenever I you know, design a product, I think this, this, is, a, this is a great bar and an inspiration for me. So, um, so what does it mean to Surface? I want to talk a little bit about you know, what we do at Surface, how we, how we think about product design. I'm an industrial designer. I don't understand anything about programming. Um, but I spent, my, I spent my time in Germany um, studying tool making, and then I studied industrial design. And, and, uh, and then I came through a couple, a couple of places into Microsoft. I started eight years ago. Um, at, the, at PC hardware designing mice and keyboards. You guys might have seen the mouse that folds like this, the Arc mouse. That was my first product. And the last one was the Arc mouse that folded flat. And so, and all the products in between. <laughs> so, so, you know, going back to the, B, to the v, VW Golf analogy, right? So a product, it needs to be a great mouse, needs to fit in your palm, but then, you know, you, you punch it flat and then you can stick it in your pocket, right? So it transforms. So there's some sort of a, pattern there if you, if you want. So I want to talk a little bit about Surface, the, the past, 
the now and the next, uh, and so to get to get um, to give a little bit of context. About four in a bit, four years and a bit ago, um, we started out being called into this project, uh, and it wasn't called Surface. We gave it we gave it a a, a code name, um, but we were twelve people as we started. Twelve people Surface started with 12 people. There was, you know, there was Panos, and there was you know, the people who now lead the engineering teams, and a, f and a few others, and then, my, and then myself. And it was a, it was a group of people who, um, who got sent on the mission, hey, let's go and make hardware for Microsoft. And, and, and then in my mind, I was like, yeah, right. You know, M Microsoft doesn't make hardware. You know, Microsoft makes software, and, and, and so on. And so it was back in, there was this, there was this um, Kind of this concept of you know how we go about our business, and then we set out doing this. And for, for in the in the first months, you know, I was like, um, this is not going to be real. But then as as further we went down, you know, the development path, the more real it became. But it was twelve people setting out um, uh, making products, and and now so many so many months and so many people later, we know of course a much larger um, group. There was this insight that that we gained. Um, as we started out in a very, very small group and setting kind of our culture and the rhythm of how we make products. And, and the, the, one, the fundamentals is, you know, products are a reflection of the people who make them. And I think this is, this is if you pick up any product and then just imagine, you know, how much passion someone must, must have had, how much care someone took or not. And imagine the meetings that led to kind of this feature. Imagine the meetings that led to that, that feature. And in, at the end of the day, it is all about the people who make the product um, that, that then the product quality reflects you know, to that fact. And it is not only the designers, of course, it's the designers, it's the engineers, it's the marketing people, it's every, every, everyone you know, who is part of creating that culture. Because in, you know, if you step back from this, it's really the way people interact with each other, the culture that you create in that group that allows you to make certain products. Um, and so that's, that's what, um, you know, that was the begin side. And so I call it the culture of product making. And how do you form a group? The bigger project than making the first surface was forming a group of, of people that uh, were passionate about making a great product and not, not passionate about any other thing. You know, we were very, very product focused. And so here's a snapshot of uh, year one. A couple of things are blacked out because I think uh, some, you know, some of the things are still you know, cooking. But um, here you see a group of people. We were in the basement of a lab, um, and there are designers and there are product uh, program managers, there are engineers, and we would meet every, you know, every day for many hours and just go and talk about the product, right? And, and it's not about the designer sitting in an ivory tower and letting out you know, the napkin sketch and tell the engineers, let's go and make it and have enough power, and then you know, everyone needs to go and do this. It's really getting a group together and figuring out you know, what is the right, you know, what's the right vision and what is the right product. Part of making a, make, you know, doing, doing this and, and, and building a group of product makers is we, have, we grew a team, homegrown, everything. We have everything in-house. Everyone from the, there's all the designers work, our Microsoft employees and you know, work, on, work in, on our campus together with the, with the engineers. Everyone that we have, you know, we, we build this group um, you know, in, on, our, on our campus, having everyone you know, in one big space in order to have these conversations, right? So if there's, you know, if there's an idea, you need to have very small um, distances of, you know, you need to walk around the corner and, 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 and talk to your colleague about this idea, and then things get you know, sparked up, and then you go about you know, making the product, and having everyone in house is critical to make that happen. So this, if you take a good look, this was the first, this, so when we started out, we, we, we made tablets, and we made a bunch of tablets, and we made these, we call them industrial design models. They come back, and they look beautiful, and you know, just like the real product, and, and they're just filled with plastic, they don't work. And many, many of these models, they look just great. And we felt, yeah, they were just another tablet. And we continued, you know, prototyping in our small space, and at some point, we um, there was this idea, oh, hey, let's go and glue a kickstand onto um, the product. And then this was the model that we made. <clears throat> There's another shot of it, a little close-up. And you see how, how, 
how poorly it's made, right? It doesn't really look good. It was done on a laser, ma laser machine. We glued some magnets in the, in the bottom and used scotch tape and, and electrical tape kind of to, to build this hinge of the kickstand. But this was the model that we back then presented to Steven Sanofsky, who ran the... Uh, who ran Windows and who was our executive sponsor. And this was basically the model that got us funded. You know, we didn't have a presentation. Um, we just brought this model. And in fact, the, 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 the white cover that you see is, is a cover that was magnetically held in that you could click in and the kickstand opened in one position, very close to the final product, the angle of the final product. Um, but it illustrated the idea, almost like the VW, you know, golf where you say, hey, you can flip the rear seats over and then you have a big trunk, you know, kind of like this. And immediately we felt there was something in this, in this um, pretty poorly made model, that, but it ref the core reflected a lot of what Microsoft was about, right? It was not all of a sudden, it wasn't just a tablet that you could use to browse the internet with, but you could some, of, some kind of transform it and, uh, and make it useful, you know, get, get stuff done, and then you would fling things back, and then you can go on and, and, you know, and, and consume um, uh, or browse the internet or whatever you want to do. And uh, the, the funny thing is that at this point I thought, oh, yeah, this is a good idea, and we, um, you know, we, uh, we are almost done. And, and realizing, you know, in hindsight, what, what a mountain of work it was that we were in front of that we had to go and solve. When we looked, when we looked at it, so we had this concept and we looked at it and said, why would, you know, why would we make hardware, right? Why, what's, the, what's the advantage of making hardware? And the, the, the thought we came back with was uh, people want to get to their digital stuff and they want to get to their digital stuff if they're at work, you know, if they're, you know, if, you know, if, if they are mo like, a, like someone in the mobile workforce or they sit in the office or they sit on their couch and the, the stuff they want to get to needs to conform to the to the situation uh, where they're in. And we thought of, of hardware as a stage for software, which means the reason to have hardware is to get you to your, your digital stuff as easy, as smooth, and convenient, and you know, fast as possible. And we, you know, therefore, we wouldn't design something that looks just amazing with a lot of chrome and, and things around it. Everything that we wanted to design wanted to go and dissolve away and to make room for the, for the software experience that, that, that you should have. So, you know, we thought of it as a stage and kind of in a very primitive way. We always start out projects. We collected images of stages to just visualize because, you know, it, we talked to, you know, in the, on the engineering side or to us as in the design team, we said, you know, the, the, the act, the show is the software and the hardware is all of, all of what you don't see in, in this picture, right? It should just dissolve away. Just like the keyboard, when you don't need it, you fling it you know, to the back and it should just not bother you, right? And, or if you add stuff to it, if you add a kickstand and if you don't use it, you shouldn't feel it, right? The kickstand should kind of dissolve away instead of, you know, like a Swiss, like a Swiss army knife, but when you add the tool, it gets bigger, you know, you have, a bigger, you have a bigger object and we wanted to achieve the opposite, just like having things fold away. So, so in, we have a lab um, uh, with, with our group, our model shop got, got built up and we added a bunch of 3D uh, printers. And the, the idea here was um, uh, rapid prototyping. So the, these printers you might have seen, you know, you, you mock something up on your, on your computer and then send it to print and within hours, you know, you get, a, you get something physical that you can hand. And you can, you know, prototype and see how, you know, how it feels can prototype different geometry, different weights and sizes and so on. And we did hundreds of those. Every, you know, if you have an idea, good, let's go and print it and let's check it out. The, the idea of rapid prototyping for us is, you know, fail, fail fast to succeed sooner. You know, we had a thousand bad ideas or maybe two thousand bad ideas. And then once in a while there was something we go like, oh, this is kind of nice, you know, and let's go and keep that. Uh, we, the disadvantage was the small room we were in, uh, we filled out with models and cartons and it was always a big mess we, um, uh, where, where, where we worked, but uh, they were kind of useful, so we used them almost like as 3D, um, 3D drawings. When we started out Surface, Windows 8 was about six months ahead of us. We hadn't had 
had no idea how this software would, would perform. And here's a snapshot of um, a model that we made and we got some printouts and we tried to figure out, okay, how does the swiping work? Back then, there was the mandate of having a 16 by nine aspect ratio. You know, that, that kind of came in from, from the Windows team and we, you know, we, we tried to get to terms with it. So how, how would you, you know, how would you interact with a device like this? And what is the right screen size? So and then so we went we went through this. The the other part was okay. Now we have an idea. Now we know what kind of software you know works for it. We have a vision, and we sat in a meeting. And uh, there's a gentleman who runs my materials team. Uh, his name is Alec Ishihara, and he he said, oh, we could we could injection mold magnesium, and then we have kind of a watch quality finish. And when he said that, the, he kind of everyone wanted that. There was an, there was an image in our mind's eye of like, oh, watch quality finish. That sounds so you know, so awesome. Yeah, let's make, let's make this. And magnesium was a, was a great choice, and we studied it a little bit. Um, it gives you about 35% less weight than aluminum, and so you could then go and make uh, at least the structure lighter than, men, you know, than, than, uh, than other people make their tablets um, and, have a, and have a strategic advantage. It was just the, the problem was that the investment to go, go to magnesium was enormously high. But, you know, the way kind of we... Um, you know, our, our team behaved was like, okay, let's go and master these materials and, and, and do this. And so watch quality finish when it first came out looked like this. It looked really crappy, you know. And, and, uh, and I, I remember when, the, when, when this, this first part was delivered to us, to Redmond, and uh, I got a phone call. I was like, yeah, you know, the first parts are here, and they, you know, they look okay. You know, and so then, like we walked into this meeting, um, someone pulled out of a red, out of a, out of an envelope, and I, I remember the emotion I had of this, like, oh my God, this is uh, this is going to be a longer process. Uh, and that year, I think I flew, um, I flew to China every every month or so. Um, this is a this is a shot that we had at the tooling shop. So we injection molded uh, magnesium, and this was the largest injection molded part of magnesium that was done at this time. It is an extremely hard process to injection mold magnesium. Uh, later on, there's Vinit who's going to talk a bit deeper about, you know, the, the manufacturing side. But as you know, magnesium cor yeah, is, you know, is, is very uh, 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 corrosive. It, it reacts with oxygen immediately. So we had to go and figure out, you know, how to get how to suck the oxygen out of the tool, you know, um, and, and how, to, how to mold this piece um, uh, so all, you know, in, in this large form factor, there's, uh, there's uh, molding pressure there, mold release agents that was all innovated on. So the, the depth in innovation that we did in the first round of Surface was crazy. We have, you know, we have, we have, we have IP on the, on the tools that, that make the Surface. This is how deep we went in with our manufacturing engineering group. And, and it was hard. And the, but the other thing that we found was the people that, that then came to our group and worked with us, they were as fanatic as the industrial designers, right? As the group of 12 that set out said, hey, let's go make the best product you know, we can make. And, uh, and what formed was not only the first generation of Surface, was all, what also formed was a group of people who went through some long, long working hours and you know, together and formed as a team and set kind of the culture of when we talk about perfect products, right? So nothing is ever perfect, but we run to this kind of asymptote and try to get as close as possible. And, and good enough is, is never good enough, right? And so that kind of culture grew when we, when we did this. And so the first generation of Surface happened, as, as you know. Then we, did the, then we did the second generation of Surface where we where we, you know, it's always like you, you work on the first, on one generation and then you get insights of how to make things better, but you kind of, there are always ship dates, right? So you ship the first generation while you then start kicking off the second generation. And then sometimes you get an idea that is so complex um, that you need to develop it over a bunch of generations in order to make it really work. And one of those ideas was, um, the, uh, the continuous kickstand that you see in Pro 3, you know, we, this, the insight that you want to have multiple kickstand positions or you want to have it continuous. We got relatively early. It was just super hard to make this part um, re, you know, reliable in, um, in, in such small envelope. And so that, you know, some of these things, they just have a very long innovation path and they go on in parallel. Um, let me have a sip of water. 
excuse me. <clears throat> so in this, in this early um, or kind of first, first stage of surface, you know, growing, learning, listening, building a team, those were kind of the pieces that, that went on. And then snapping to the now, um, I have, uh, so we've been, we've been moving, when we started with a small group, we were, in a, we were in one room and we constantly moved to other spaces because we all constantly outgrew the space we were in with you know, the people we hired and the, and the 3D models that were, in, that were in our way and we had to kind of go in and, uh, and get more space. And I have a, uh, oftentimes when people come to our place, we, we show them where we live now. There's this awesome um, uh, building that we, took over, it was the first, first it was the Microsoft Library. It's a space that is about 100,000 square foot. And if you imagine, so imagine we, you know, we are in Redmond. There's one, one office building that we have where we, you know, where the people have their offices and we have our meeting rooms. And then there's another building, um, 100,000 square feet that houses um, our design studio, our prototyping lab, uh, and all our testing facilities. So that's a space where all the talents in our group can come together and prototype and, and work together. So uh, if, you, if you come to Redmond, some of you, some of you people have um, and visit this building, it's, it's quite impressive. And so I thought, you know, for this talk, what, what could we do? So there's this guy, Brian Townsend, who does our videos and animations. And um, I asked him to buy a video drone. And last week we flew around the campus. It was quite, uh, quite nice weather and we took, put this video together. I uh, hope we have sound, and, uh, and it gives you a little bit of an introduction of how we work now, and so that's kind of the, that's kind of this, the, the space we live in now and design our products. The moment you bring physical representation of your idea to a decision-making table, everything changes. To make a product, you really have to engage in a whole different level of problem solving. And no product is ever designed by one person. We've been able to bring all of our diverse talent across engineering and design and prototyping under one roof. It enables inspiring each other from your different ways of how you look at the world. You know, an engineer can inspire a designer, a prototyper can find the next engineering solution. And by all working together, we dissolve into this group of product makers. We have to look beyond our disciplines in order to push things further. Because only if you look beyond your discipline, you understand that the greater goal is not only to be the best in your discipline and win a design award or something like that. The greater goal is to make a product that people love. Yeah. It's a big place. It's a super awesome playground. Um, serious one, though. And uh, uh, it's, it's kind of nice to see where we've come from, right? So from like a handful of people with an idea um, and, and working at a place like Microsoft um, with so much, you know, passion and trust to kind of see what the, you know, be be passionate about the vision that we created and then go and support you know, a handful of people into the group that we are now. And so this is a, this is a massive building. You know, this, it, it, it's, a, it's not a hobby shop, right? So we are, we are in for, you know, for a long term here. And, um, and you can just imagine you know, we, um, all the people who work there. You know, there's, there's lots of stuff you know, that, uh, that we can come up with. But it, is, but it is a lot of fun. So what, where we went from the past to the now, and, and you, have, um, 
you have Surface Pro 3 and it's a big success for us and it's, it's super nice for me to see, you know, people outside of Redmond, you know, using your device. And at first I thought, hey, are you at Microsoft? Uh, but no, they just bought the product because they like it. And, and it is such an interesting insight that by keeping the vision, because we, we, we knew it was the right vision for us to pursue, but refining the recipe of you know, screen size and weight and then pushing innovation f f you know, further forward, you all of a sudden reach a sp sweet spot that resonates with people. Right? And so that's kind of cool. Here's a, here's a quick animation of um, the kind of the key things that we changed from, from Pro to to Pro 3. And so we, when, we did, when we designed the, the Surface Pro, um, there were immediately fans. You know, it was the, the, for even the first generation was rather, you know, rather heavy and you know, you know, a bit clunky, a little tank. But people loved it because it ran real windows and they could do things with them that, with it that, that they couldn't do with any other machine. You know, it was a little powerful you know, machine and it was, um, and it, it solved some serious you know, user needs and we were inspired by looking at people taking them out. And so when we, when we designed um, Pro 3, if you take a look at, you know, it was this thing went from 13 millimeters and we pushed Pro 3 down to 9.1 millimeters, right? And so the reason why we could do this was we made a larger screen and so on. But it actually, the, the, the difference is profound, right? It's, it went from something that looked yeah, like a, you know, like a little tank, like a stealth bomber kind of undestructible piece to something that is really more in the, you know, in the, in the consumer electronics, you know, space. You know, people, people really want to have it instead of they understand the need and then they buy it. The, the other thing that was important to us um, that we found out was we increased the, the screen size, you know, from 10.6 you know, we went all the way to 12 inches, and that was a that was a huge change for the uh, people's experience. That extra uh, real estate gave you just enough, you know, pixel ergonomics in order to go and run, you know, real programs, right? Instead of instead of apps, um, but it made the it kept the product small enough so it was you know easy to carry. It's very close to kind of a European A4 or a US letter format, and it kind of fits into briefcases and things that people already carried around. And because it was slim, um, because it was had a bigger um, surface area, we could make it slimmer because we could kind of spread out the battery across a larger surface area. And so you had then a product that was more powerful and it was even lighter, and so on, um, and it was and it was thinner. Than, uh, than its predecessors, and all of a sudden the recipe was right. The other thing that we did with this product that, that the, there, was an in, there was an insight, you've seen the, um, the image I showed before, the injection molding magnesium, and it was, we really pushed the limits on, on, on injection molding magnesium, literally, because you, we, could make, we couldn't make a 12 inch size magnesium injection molded um, piece because the, the physics on how you control the, the tooling and, and the injection molding process were just at its limit with, with its predecessor. So it kind of pushed us to uh, jump into CNC machining the, the, the bucket or the chassis from one bit of uh, magnesium. And that, that had the, you know, the, the, uh, the challenge was that we had to go and invest in the massive amount of machines in our, in our manufacturing, and that required another commitment you know, on the Microsoft level to go and go all out and get you know, and believe in this product. The advantage was that if you see in C machine, if you tool stuff, you always have to you know, get at a point where you say, okay, now it's ready, we, we have another engineering validation unit, let's go and, and release for tooling. And then you sit there for 10, 12 weeks and wait for the tools to be done, and innovation kind of stops. You can think about what you will do when stuff is back, but stuff is not going to be back for another 12 weeks. And if you think of the iterations that you need to make a product perfect, if you always have 10, 12 week blocks in, this, in your development process, you wasting a lot of time. And so with going to CNC in there, we got rid of this waiting time. We could, you know, you have seen the big um, prototyping facility that we have now. We have the ability to CNC machine production level um, 
units right in right next to the design studio and figure out you know how this change would impact the performance right so an example is you know there's this vent there's this vent the perimeter vent that runs around your surface and um, relatively late or pretty close to production time we looked at it and I was like oh I, I don't like I don't like the spacing of it, you know, it, it doesn't look right. And we changed it. And we could then machine a couple of units within the two days in our, in our shop and then get them back and, then, and look at them visually and then test the performance, right? It's impossible to do if you, have a, if you have to commit to a tool and then, you know, sorry, tools are released, you know, there's nothing you can do. And we completely eliminated that, that process. And it was a huge advantage. So we, have, we can now pack in more and more iteration cycles in a product development cycle in order to perfect what we want to, what we want to do and 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 if you if you ever design products uh, if you get another iteration cycle that's always awesome because you can always push to the ne the, the product to the next level and here's here's an image I, I really like aesthetically and I'm I'm not sure how close you know you you guys um, are to product development but I guess I heard someone saying was code it's the same way so if you look at the outside of Surface 3 looks really nice. The inside, and this is actually not Pro 3, this is Surface 3, but if you take a look at the inside, the geometry that, that was created, it's not that we, we industrially design from the inside and make the product purposefully beautiful from the inside. It is just the fact that our engineering team and our design team work so closely with each other that the products reach a level of fitness, meaning the performance to weight um, to, you know, the ruggedness to, to weight and all these elements get to a level of balance that, you know, that reaches, you know, a geometry like this. It's, you know, it's at a level of engineering that we couldn't make better, right? At this point, we had no idea how to make this part better, and then it was finally right. And, the, you know, what does good enough look like when we say, let's go and ship a product? Good enough is for us when we've pushed every, every lever and every limit and the finally something that started primitive went to a long time being complex and too much and not quite there yet. And then if you push things hard enough and have passion enough, then, then a product turns into the space we call simple. You know, things all of a sudden become easier. You know, you get more performance and things get lighter, you know, and stuff, beca stuff becomes easier. But just you have to push through this, you know, through this big mountain of stuff is still too complicated, not good enough. Let's go back. You know, one more, one more iteration cycle, not good enough, let's test it. And then you land at something and you say, okay, now we can go and, now we can go and ship it. And so that, for me, this image represents this. On Pro 3, of course, you know, you know all, the, all the electronics, all, you know, all the architecture inside, we've all made, you know, engineered in the, same, in the same building that you just saw. In order to pack you know, powerful processors in there, we had to invent um, cooling systems you know, thermal uh, engineering needed to happen on a big scale in order to, you know, to control the heat that these processes would create inside it, but also in order to give someone, you know, a workstation um, that's powerful enough. So a mechanical engineering team always designs the next generation of Surface Pro on the previous generation of Surface Pro, and that's kind of one of these... One of, the, uh, one of the things that I'm, and same thing for the designers, you know, we design our CAD uh, programs run on, run on surfaces. And we don't get the core i7s, we usually get like pre-released units and they run, the, the, the specs are not that, not top of the line, but these machines, they pull their weight and it's, uh, it's quite awesome, um, you know, to, to design the next generation on the previous one. And, and so we, we take a lot of pride in that. Um, so I talked, I talked a bit about the innovations that take, the, the insights that you get um, while you design a product, but they're just so big in terms of complexity uh, that they take multiple generations to, to implement. And for us, this was the continuous kickstand. I remember we were like somewhere in the, in the middle, maybe not quite on, on Surface 2, where we, where we played around with two position kickstands, and then we like, it really needs to be, it really, the, the real solution is to just go and have a continuous one. And then we started looking into this and a team went there and it's, it's, it's not easy. And so it took us all the way to Surface Pro 3 to, um, to implement this. Here's an animation on, you know, how this actually looks inside. You know, this is, this is the top of the kickstand and inside there's this hinge that has, that, 
that that has a friction element that that grips around a um, a uh, a cam, so so that you can imagine the 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 torque that you get when you open it just slightly is much different when you have it in draw mode and the you know the forces that that apply. And in order to get this, is this is a dynamically um, the, a, a friction that is that is designed to be dynamic. So it changes as you as you open the kickstand. You don't feel it because you you know you're pulling on you're pushing on a different lever as the lever arm changes. So to say, the forces adjust. And it just took a whole lot of the concept was there pretty quickly, but to make it uh, perform like this just took an endless amount of time. And so then finally in Surface, in Surface uh, Pro 3, we, we could make it. And so that was, that was pretty nice. And besides just having you know, a kickstand that, rotate, that, that opens up to 130 degrees, um, I'm sorry, 150 degrees, uh, what we achieved was we have this this mode that we call draw mode. Um, another element that we kind of nurtured along was a pen, of course. You know, every every surface comes with a pen, and it's it's interesting because we all come from a mouse and keyboard culture. You know, we have the you know we grew up on Windows and you know clicking folders, and all of a sudden you have this touch thing that comes in and. You know, with, with Windows 8, you know, you go like, oh, touch thing came in, maybe it came in a bit massive. But what also came in was the ability to draw on your, on your device, right? Use it as a canvas. And, and for me, it, and it's a very, you know, it's, it's been done, you know, pen computing and things like this have been done, you know, uh, for quite some years. But um, the kind of adoption and, 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 use, and usability of these systems are right now just about to come to the, to the point where um, you actually can compare them with a the pen. And if you think about you know, what you do with a pen and paper, it, it, you know, it's quite profound what, you know, what we all do with our note, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, journals, moleskin books, when we go and take notes. And, and for us, it was very important not to only have a tablet that transforms to a laptop, but, but then go one step further and have some sort of clipboard you know, effect or drawing mode where we really build a stage for the pen to interact with the software and then enable things you know, in, 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 in that space. And you can just imagine you know, if you have you know, a, a, you know, a person delivering a package, someone filling out a form, someone taking notes at schools, there, there are these rich spaces. Um, where a pen makes a lot of sense, right? And this is one of when we launched Surface 3, we created this picture, and it was really all about, you know, enabling, um, enabling people to put their thoughts down, you know, on digital paper, right? Instead of, instead of typing it and, and doing it kind of the traditional way. Um, all right. So the next, I'm, I thought I'm going to show all the products that we're developing now. The, all the Top secret ones, but then I wasn't allowed to, so I apologize. But uh, but I talk a little bit. I talk a little bit about what kind of what kind of fuels us now, um, as we've done three generations of of surfaces and and where our mind is, and as we uh, how we look at how we look at computers for my, for Microsoft, right? And so that's this, that's this whole thing. And and one part of it is it's exactly how we started out. There's this line, you know to have people do what they love and get done, get done what they need. And it kind of sums up what, what we were trying to achieve with Surface. And I think we're tr still trying to achieve this um, with, the, with, with every, everything that we are developing right now. Because it's like if you want to touch someone's heart as a, you know, as a, as a user, and if this is a business person or if this is a consumer, and every, it's, it's kind of all blend, blending away. But you want, to, you want to find, you want to pick up a device that, you know, viscerally tells you there's, here's a device that is made from quality, right? Here's a device that I can put all my stuff in and it doesn't break, it's not too slow in a year and, and it gets me to all the things that I need to get to. Many people use surfaces to get the job done, to give them the money to, you know, to buy products like this, right? So as much, it's not a, it's not a tool that you buy for consumption, it's a tool that you buy to go through your busy life and get stuff done, right? You you write your papers on it, you write you know, your reports on it, you can sketch your next ideas, but you also wake up and have your coffee in the morning and browse the internet, right? And then you 
and then you know you look at your emails and then you go and answer some and it's in this whole flow weaving weaving through your day with this product and make the product kind of dissolve in that day and make the product go away because all you're interested in all you're interested in is the software that you want to use, right? And so that's what we are still, that's what we are still about, you know, dissolving in behavior, if you want. And so if you think about this, it's, a, it's an awesome problem because uh, you want to do this, and then you, you're, in, you're, you're entering these two vectors, right? One vector is the vector of technology, which is super fast and always changing, you know, USB-C and no, 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 all these things, you know, next generation of processors and operating systems and stuff like this. And then, and then you have the vector of people, you know, my, uh, you know, my mom is still catching up with the first generation of Surface, right? And so the insight is that, you know, people, people, uh, people don't really want to go and, and jump on the next new thing and take the class and learning this, right? So, so a, a, one of the most famous American designers, um, Raymond Lowy, said, most advanced yet acceptable, meaning, meaning you, you, push, you, bring, you push to the next, to the next step without losing the people who are in the now. And that's, a, that's, a, that's an important continuum, right? Because if you buy this super nice new product, and you can, cannot use your Logitech mouse or your Microsoft mouse or whatever, whatever accessory you have that you really like, uh, you lose someone, right? Or you ask someone to buy adapters and things like this. So for us, you know, one of, the, of course, these, the icons was put a USB port in. You know, we had a huge discussion. Of course, aesthetically, oh my God, you know, it's this big opening in the device and how can you do this? And then, but then you look at people, you know, and they just have a whole bunch of stuff uh, that plugs in through USB and you don't want to go and, and lose, leave these people behind, right? And so it's managing... Um, managing everyone to this next level. And, and while they use your product, have the greatest amount of fun and the greatest level of productivity. So th those, are, those are two very interesting vectors. And now this is, this, these, there are two other vectors. Um, and, and they are important when I think about design, but I think also they, they you know, if you, if any, they apply to so many other things. You know, if you, if you design an app, right, for example, there's the, what the app does and, and how it appears, right? So there's, on one end, there's, on one vector, there's the, the, the content, what the product does. And on the other one is the expression, right? How it, how it comes across, how it feels, how it, how it behaves while it does it. <clears throat> and, and for us in the, in the team, it is, uh, it is always finding that balance between what you want to do with it and, and how, you do is how you do it. And, and in there, it's a bit esoteric, but in there, there's the choice of going to magnesium and investing a, a, a mountain of money in order to let 30% of the weight out in order to, have, to reach this fitness, right? Or for us, it's the, you know, because we want to go and have better products, we invest in a gazillion amount of money to buy all these CNC machines in, in manufacturing just to get this product a little bit better. You know why? Because when you walk into a Microsoft store and you see a Surface and you pick it up, the emotion that it radiates and gives you a preview of how this product will be you know, in, in your day, you know, it's super important that you get this expression. You know, when you buy cars, how the car door closes, somehow talks about how the engine is crafted, how much passion and how much attention someone put on these details. Of course, you can cheat with car doors, but it's very hard to cheat with products that are so light and packed in with, you know, full with, with electronics. You know, every, every time you make a change, everything else needs to change. So, that, so those are two, two very, very important things. And especially if you're talking to an audience like this, you know, productivity is always, is always a big topic. And productivity is an, is an important topic for us as well. When, we, when I was in PC hardware uh, designing mice and keyboards, there was a mindset of productivity. Productivity meant, oh, the Arc mouse? Oh, that's not a productivity mouse. That's kind of a mobile user mouse. And, then, and the productivity mice were the ones that were on the desktop and you had you know, you have palm rests for your keyboards. Because back then, you know, people are productive, sit in offices, in cubicles, and then they go and punch away on, on, uh, on their keyboards and, and do away with their mice and on desktop, on these beige computers under the desk. But then just think about now, that has completely dissolved, right? The computer has dissolved into all these different things. You know, many of these computers that we use mostly are in our pockets, right? And, and so we go through the day with our phones. And so productivity has changed as well, and it has changed in a, in a, in, in a big time. If you walk into a, a power plant and you, have, you, know, and you, and you can take a picture of 
you know, the, the situation that you have to go and fix, you know, and if you can get immediate information on what the right valve is that you need to go and exchange or whatever the problem is. You know, if you go in a hospital and you go to a patient visit and you explain a certain situation to the patient and you can bring the data to the bed instead of bringing these big monitors that are all that scary, you know, that makes you all of a sudden super productive. We, we, had a, we had a physician talking to us about how they go through their day and, and by being able to plan a, you know, and bring the data to, a, to the patient using a surface in this case. How much more time they would save that for themselves and how much more patient time they could generate, um, which was super valuable for the, you know, for the patient, obviously. And so anyway, so if you think of, uh, if you think of productivity, we've zoomed out there, but we had a bunch more crazy, more crazy slides um, in this presentation than this. But the, this one I thought I liked. Uh, uh, this, is a, this is an alg algebra a sheet from a seventh grader, I think, right? So good math, you know, learning. And, and then, but just notice the doodles, right? And so I was intrigued by this thing, you know, it's, you, know you do a go about your math and then your mind wanders off and you have a good, good idea. And this is, you know, very similar of how, um, how we work in our design team. This is, these are all our, you know, sketchbooks. This is cool. Someone should fix that. Um, these are, these are all our, all our um, sketchbooks that we had in the first generation. And, and it is so powerful um, to use them. You know, this is in context of design, but then people who write software, pe people who are creative in their minds, you know, and including everyone who has to solve problems. A sketch um, is, is able to capture an unfinished thought, right? So this is the earliest sketch I could find in my sketchbook from... Uh, from a surface, and uh, it's it's kind of wild uh, looking at it now. But but it's this thing you, you know you doodle around and you you come up with this idea and then and then you move on and have a couple of other ideas and then you come back to the sketch and add to it, and you you can go and express a thought with a pen. And that is not very precise. Imagine you have to do you have to express the content that you see here with a keyboard. It, it's 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 kind of hard, right? You need to be a poet in order to kind of capture unfinished thoughts, but not many of us are poets. So, so a pen, I think, is, very, is it's super powerful. And so as we are thinking about our pen, there's this, there are also these two vectors. And one is, you know, we call it super normal. You know, why, why can we not put the pen inside the device? Why can't we have a super small pen, right, the stylus? And we went through this and thought, you know, what is important to us? And we, we came to this point where we said, you know, a pen for a surface should be a, should be a pen very similar to the pens that you had all, all around, right? It should have a certain diameter, it should have a certain weight, and it should feel super great when you go in and, and put it to the screen and, and write and draw. And we put a ton of uh, emphasis and detail engineering on how it feels when the pen writes on our glass, right? One of the things is that we want, we always have the, you know, we have the best screens in the industry, and part of what this means is that the cover glass on top of it, you know, needs to be smooth. And now we're designing the little black tip that you see there. We've put an enormous amount of energy into the, finding the right material and manufacturing it in such a way that it gives you, you know, a certain amount of friction. And it balance, and, and then if you get into that, you find out that, oh, there are people like me who draw, who want to have a pen that is rather fast. And then people like my boss, who is a writer, um, who wants to have this pen rather, rather, you know, rather slow and add some friction. And this might sound like a trivial detail. We spent weeks and weeks and weeks talking about it and, and making prototypes and trying things out and, you know, having really, you know, energized meetings about it. You know, my, well, my, my boss, Pan, Panos, is a writer and I'm a drawer. And so the, I draw and so we ended up with something that fits right in the middle. And it's kind of nice because it kind of spans, almost like an HB pencil, it spans a wide enough spectrum because people do very different things with it. So for us, um, it, it, was, it was extremely important that we got the best writing feel um, on the hardware and that the pen has a diameter that is ergonomic and you can write for a long time, right? If you, if, if, if these instruments become very small, you can do short bursts, you know, like notes and stuff. But if you want to write an essay, or if you want it, if you do drawing, if you're designing on it, you know, it needs to it needs to be thicker. So we designed it in a size that it's a, a, a normal good ballpoint pen or fountain pen. And the big advantage is that it doesn't leak, so you don't have to have your 
pocket protectors with you, right? But then if you think about it, then there's the superpower, and it's very similar to uh, digital cameras, where uh, when, you know, we all had these, you know, SLRs, and we took pictures, and we, we brought them to develop, you develop the you develop them and then a week later someone picked them up after getting the groceries and then you look at these pictures, right? But now the, when, the, when digital cameras came around, you instantly could see them, right? And the first digital cameras were kind of low quality, but they were good enough because you could do things with them that you could not really do instantly with, with a, with a uh, physical or a chemically pr uh, produced picture, which was you could email them, right? And so things like this. And that was, there was some, some sort of a superpower that we added to cameras um, that, uh, that just the experience and what you could do with them now was just so much bigger than what you could ever do with your you know, chemical photo. And, uh, and very similar things happen with when you take a ballpoint pen and you make it f look and feel and behave just like the ballpoint pen, but the marks, the notes you do, the sketches you draw, they all of a sudden digital, right? They can be instantly synced to your colleagues. You know, notes can be taken and translated automatically into text and written out. You know, you can take it, uh, you, can, you can go and find a website, you know, maybe annotate, sn snap it out, and then send it to someone, right? The, the, the intuitive power that sits in the, in the ancient tool of a pen combined with the um, with the superpower of being digital is, a, is just a great, great value, right? And so we'll, you'll see us continue to explore this and continue to build experiences around this because I think, you know, pen is much older than the typewriter and I think it deserves to move into the digital space and you know, give it some horsepower and, and make it awesome. And we, you know, and we listen a lot to the, the feedback, right? So you go, it's like, oh, you cannot really store it in, in the device. Well, even if we had a stylus, there would not be enough room in the device. You know, not even a toothpick would fit into our device because it's all kind of packed, you know, with uh, w with electronics. And so, so we we chose to make it this size. And then now we constantly, you know, think about how do we make it better? How do we how do we make it better? You know, another one of on this one, uh, just one more thought on the pen. When we designed the pen and had all these um, all these thoughts and and went and went about it. We, we came across, you know, if you have a good idea of your, if your spouse calls you and says, hey, you know, here's a list, we're on your way back, go to the supermarket. You know, you, and if you have a, and if you have a moleskin and a pen ready, you can just ready, you're ready to write your notes right away. Or if you have a good idea, but just imagine you don't have your, you know, pen and paper, you have a computer and then you have your good idea and then you press the on button and then you, and you log in and then you open the application and then, and so by then the switching cost you know, is so high that it may be not be worth to, to write down the brilliant idea you have and later on you forget. So we had this idea of, oh, why wouldn't you just go and click just like a, opening a ball pen, pen and you get, you get to OneNote. And, and that was a very interesting experience for us. We, we, have, uh, we prototyped it into our studio and the people who came in were very inspired and then so then we collaborated with OneNote to get this feature uh, done. And it just shows a... Uh, for me, it shows a point that if you, you know, hardware as a stage should kind of fall in, in the back and, and should not be, be there when you're in your software, but at the same time, hardware enables software to happen. Um, the usage of OneNote went through the roof on Surface Pro 3. You know, why? It's the same OneNote that you have on any other computer, but you can click on it and you'll be there, right? So there's, we designed a shortcut, like in Ikea when you just go through the, straight to the kitchen, straight to the restaurant. Um, uh, to, we designed an experience in hardware that creates a path for software, right? And so these, it, these intersections are incredibly powerful, right? If you, if you have a vision as a company, you know what you're after, you know, do what people love and get done what you need. You, you can do an amazing job with the software, the best job in the world. But then if you only do software, you, you're always behind glass. And that's as far as it goes, right? But then it just, ex it just imagine you extend that idea, go one step further and make hardware, and then, and then really bridge to build a bridge to bridge it to the people who use it, right? Because since we cannot plug the internet in our head, there's still a physical bridge that everyone needs. Everyone needs a device in order to get to their digital stuff, and I think that's what we do. And sometimes we, we want to, most of the time, we want to make it go away. And and often we look for these experiences we can create with, this, with the 
um, with a special feature like the, we call it click node. Uh, you, <laughs> school backability, you guys have maybe heard of lapability, right? And we wanted to put the Wikipedia entry because this word, did, word didn't really exist. And I think Wikipedia didn't let us, I don't think it's in there. But so school backability was, uh, we, we launched Surface Pro 3 and we were happy with it. Um, and then we thought, well, there, is all, there was a Surface 2, you know, we should make a Surface 3. And what is the essence, what's the essence of that product versus the Pro 3? Well, first of all, uh, happy are the people who have the money to can afford the Pro 3, right? But so not every high schooler, you know, can go and shell out that amount, that amount of money, right? And so part of the idea was, oh, let's go and make a product that has the same essence of the Pro but it is for the rest of us, right? To be you know, the high schooler, you send your kid to university and something that you can, you can get your job done um, and you can also do what you love, kind of the same principles. Uh, and so out came the idea of making uh, Surface 3 and we, Surface 3 was an exercise of what can we, what can we remove um, to make it fitter for the people we had in mind, right? You know, the, uh, there's a mobile workforce. You know, you have a, you have a fleet of, of, of people who go to a customer, you know, fixing things. You know, they don't, need, they don't need the horsepower of a pro, but they need to have a full PC that is connected, that is also small enough to can throw in, a, you know, throw in a bag, has a long battery life, it's light and thin, and all these things. What applies to the fleet of um, customer-facing uh, workforce that you have also applies to high schoolers because they kind of live in the same usage pattern, right? That also applies to, you know, uh, a nurse in a hospital, right? And so that, there is the space where the, 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 the attributes of what we, what we look after in surfaces apply to a huge amount of people, um, but they don't need to have the workstation, right? Uh, our engineers and in, uh, in, a, you know, in our team and our designers, they need the professional one because they actually go and run, you know, CAD and, you know, the, mo the movie makers and people who do, you know, photography, professional photographers, you know, on site, they need the processing powers. There's always the, the space for the pro. But this one was uh, for the rest of us. And I, uh, we recently launched it, as you probably hear, and I brought a video um, that uh, is little, we call it the sizzle that introduces it. That was my last slide. <laughs> so uh, I guess um, I don't know if you if you have uh, if you have questions. Um, you know, I'm not a tech expert. I'm a I'm a designer, so don't ask me tricky questions. The future, the next, right? There was this, the next. Oh, oh. If we design, if we design another surface, should it be called 3.1 or should it be called 4? <laughs> what are the plans going forward? The plans, the plans that are going forward are, you know, as I said in the, in the, um, in the slide, it's continuing with the vision that we are on, you know, making the, the best hardware that we can make. You've seen how much... And we got, we got funding, you know, we, we built ourselves a huge development center in order to go and, you know, work together and make things better. And we've been, we've been busy, 
you know, quite a bit. And uh, um, the, the vectors I was talking about, right, so technology always moves, moves forward. There will always be the next generation of processes. There will also be the next generation of innovation that we will come up with as we, as we understand the materials that we, that we make, as we, you know, as we get you know, you know, further in refining the things that we have, or as we get completely new ideas and go and, 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 and apply them with the same rigor that we have. So I think, even though I cannot really tell you what exactly we're going to do next, but you should all, you know, stay tuned because, you know, I think we just got started. Over here. Uh, we, that's actually right, yeah. And so we, um, we don't really commit, we commit to, we release a product when it's ready, I would say, but we also don't work in a vacuum without a schedule, right? And so it's because if you think of like the, if you look at the, the patterns of technology, there's a rhythm of, let's say, you know, how, pro how processes get released, how technology gets ready. And kind of if you want or not, there's the, you're always on this kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of pattern of like, you know, here it makes sense to make a product, right? And so this is how we look at it. We look at where technology intersects to make a product that is, that is worth having, right? So because you don't want to, you don't want to ship, a, right after you ship the, you know, Surface 3, you don't want to ship a whole another thing that you now need to go and upgrade on, right? So you don't want to leave the people behind when I said that, you know, what users and people need. And nothing is worse than buying a product and then a few months later, whoops, you know, it's the next one comes out and sorry, right? But, but then so we also don't want to, don't want to lag behind, um, you know, techn technology. And so that's kind of the pattern we're looking at without giving exact dates of when we ship next things. Yeah, we we have um, we have done a huge exploration on on pen tips, and that's what you mean, right? The the pen tip. Yeah. Yeah, and so we've been so we've been testing testing a whole ton of pen, you know, pen tips, and um, and for us the most important part was that it feels good. Right, and so then, just like a like a pencil, I need to go and sharpen. Well, it's a bit more effort to go and exchange the the pen tip, right? So we ended up at a at at one that that feels that was had the best feel, um, and we had been continue have been continuously improving the the wear of it, right? But it's kind of in the materials is if you use it a lot, you know, you need to go and replace it once in a while, just like it's a you know it's just a it's just a part that you know that get, that gets used. It's a phys there's physical abuse you know, on it. And so you, you experience this. But for us, it was not making the longest lasting one. For us, it was important to make the best one that feels the best. Over here. Thank you. Ah, that's a good question. Um, we've. In, if you have followed us from the beginning, we had the, we started this, we started Surface out with a pressure sensitive, you know, cover, and uh, we launched this in the first generation. It's still available on the second generation, and there's a huge fan base around this because it makes a super thin keyboard. <clears throat> what we found was on the on these uh, on the physical keyboard, the ones with the scissor mechanism, uh, that that it aligned much better to. You know, getting your stuff done. You know, you, it was it was a great productive um, keyboard, and so we constantly receive receive feedback. It's a full size keyboard, meaning, and from an ergonomic standpoint, there's a certain kind of center to center key dimension that we measure, and it and it aligns to that. Um, there was just as everything always gets better as we as we do things. We found um, 
you know, improvements in next generation Surface 3 has modifications to the top code of the key. You know, it's much, it's much more um, uh, reliable. You wouldn't see any shiny, shiny edges. And we improved the scissor mechanisms to make it quieter and things like this. So we've been, we've been receiving a ton of input. We also do a lot of ergonomic studies. We have an ergonomics lab where we can just go and test out, you know, how things, how things perform in a lab condition and how people um, actually how the fingers land on keycaps. So we continuously you know, push, the, push these things forward. Obviously, you also want to create a, a keyboard that is you know, extremely thin and, and a device that is extremely light. And, and when I talk about fitness, it's all about finding the right balance point. Right? And, and we, you will see us adjusting that balance point as we get feedback you know, from, from, people, from an audience like this or from just visiting people you know, at schools, at work, at home. And, and getting, uh, getting feedback. One of the feedback was that we moved into Pro 3 was this, um, uh, this, mag this magnetic support that we built into, um, into the screen, right? And the feedback that we have now is, oh, you know, sometimes it's very hard to, to hit the bottom row, right? Especially as we know, many, probably many of you, you people go into Windows 10 and the bottom row, you know, is more, more pronounced. It's not that you cannot reach it, but it's like people notice that, um, you know, they kind of they kind of touch the touch the edge of the keyboard as they as they hit it, and so yeah, we get we get a ton of feedback, and we take it super serious, right? And so we we constantly then try to go and adjust and explore, because on the other hand, you don't want to lose that magnetic support, right? And so finding and and, and that often this stuff describes an awesome engineering problem that we then all go and solve. Yeah, there's an there's an there's a Surface app that we have. You can download where you can adjust the pressure sensitivity. And so you, there's a slider, and then there, right next to it, there's a field where you can try it out and 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 dial it into your liking. Yeah, but that, that fixes it to one sensitivity. Uh huh. You know, like with the PPI, the, uh, the Surface Pro. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Right. So we have uh, no. I don't know the number. I think over uh, over a thousand sixty-four. So pressure pressure levels, right? How much? What? Ten twenty-four. Was close. So uh, of pressure levels, which would do the same thing. Okay. Let me let me look here. At one. Okay, we have four four minutes left. The last person who asks a question, I have a Surface Pro three. I can give away. <laughs> well, you're not the see if you're the last. Okay, so when we started out with twelve, um, the, the, so there was this culture that you create, and it's a it's a it's a phenomenal. Inside, actually, and I think it's it's phenomenal insight for anyone who works in, in any in any corporation. There is a you walk into a company and there's a culture, and the culture grew over over time to whatever it is. And it was a huge advantage for us to start really as a garage startup. Well, you know, it was a garage startup inside of Microsoft, and then we had to figure things out. Right, and so there were the values that we created and the culture that we created um, led us through the first like 50 people, and you could kind of organically. You know, people would come in, they would kind of figure out, like, oh, how, how does the service team work? And then they would adjust. The, what happens is then you grow larger, and, and we are super busy, right? If you hire, get hired on, let's say, as an engineer, you would come in from the company wherever you worked before, and, uh, and, and you would be thrown into a project and it's all, like, busy, and you need to go and solve problems. What happens is... You use the tools that you bring from your other company because that's what you're used for, right? And but that's what you're used to, and 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 try to problem solve like this. But Surface works very different, right? It is not a, you know, we ha the values that we have of, uh, you know, uh, having you know perfect products, you know, fail fast to succeed sooner, right? No, we don't want any cynics, right? We want like get, we often talk about, you know, grab an oar, you know, and and work, you know, and and get to work, you know, help your team, see what you can do, help out, right? And so 
um, these are not the va oftentimes these values don't match with our, you know, with other companies, and so you need to go and adjust to them. Right? And so what we've done is, as a leadership team, we've done, we've paid a gr great amount of attention to how do we how do we cultivate you know these types of values? Because if you come into to our place, you have no idea how you, should, you know what what's the right thing to do in this situation. You know, is it scheduled? Is it cost? Is it product features? And you know, and there needs to be a decision. And my job is on the line or not? Or, you know, and so all these things that you ask yourself as someone who comes into our team. And so we've been we've been working on talking about these values that we have. Um, to bring people on to get them kind of calibrated on this is important to us and it works really well um, because once once you understand what the team is about that we have a vision and we actually really would not let go on this feature right now really really I really want to have this feature right and we should go and really prototype it out and 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 kind of this relentlessness um, and how it's actually practiced is something that we're trying to go and 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 teach the great talent that we hire, so they, you know, rather fast kind of see, you know, what what's the flag that we are, what what's the flag we are running at? You know, we get rewarded by making the greatest products, and not by playing the safest game. if you want, so many hands. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's the there's the red light that comes up, and the guy who guy kicks me out. Um, so. Uh, Let's say the gentleman over there in, in the red. Yeah, you. Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I spent. I have uh, my my family. I have I have two teenage daughters, and uh, thirteen and seventeen, and and oftentimes I bring uh, sometimes I bring unreleased products home and say, hey, check this out, and uh, they are the harshest critics. Um, so uh, it is. Uh, uh, so so th this is very this is very inspiring. I also spend a lot of time um, mountain biking with my friends, and this is kind of in the in the woods for hours, going away, not being connected to any technology, and just like go and be off. It's a it's a great way to recharge, and and you know whenever I can travel to cities like you know Chicago, it's it or others, it's, it's, very it's very inspirational. I think you need, I'm trying to have enough time off because if you're just at work, it is, uh, yeah, it, it, it kind of screws with your mind too much. Um, over here. How much of what you do is influenced by what other manufacturers do? Ah, uh, not, not much really. I think we, of course, we all take competitors' products, we take them apart and understand how did they make this, how did they make that. But um, I don't really look at the competition. We have, uh, you know, we have an idea and we're trying to make it. And oftentimes, you know, we, we try to understand how other people manufacture stuff because it's good learning, but, um, but really not much. Um, we're trying to do our own thing. Yeah, <laughs> Surface Pro 3. <laughs> um, uh, let's see over here. Yeah, yeah. So it's this intersection of um, uh, technology advances, and you don't want to leave people behind, right? And at some, sometimes, if you see with our pen, we are we are the the innovation makers, right? Because we introduce a technology that we really believe in, uh, and then we cultivate it so people can adopt it, right? This is new to the world stuff. But on a thing like a USB port where people have just a whole bunch of things, we don't want to leave them behind. And there will be, of course, an intersection where we, where we move on to the next standards, right? But we, it is being, this move is going to be done with a lot of care, uh, looking at how much people have invested already in this, in their, in their, in their, in their either surface accessories that they have in their businesses or the stuff that they have at their home, right? And so making sure that we don't go and, uh, mess this up. So if you have just invested in a whole bunch of, I don't know, let's say docking stations, right? You know, it's important. Is there a special reason that the package for the pen is priced on the right side and on the dock on the left side? Because I always switch, yeah, sorry. Okay, say it again. The dock. The magnet for the pen 
Ja. Ah, okay, okay. Um, there is there is actually what you see in the what you see with the magnetic force on the for the pen on the device side comes from the charging magnets. So they were not designed to hold the pen. Even the, the steel in the battery, you know, holds it, and it was purposefully designed in the docking station on the left. But it's a great observation. Okay, last question. <laughs> Ah, the keyboard, the keyboard connector. I always felt that, you know, I could design a more laughable keyboard. Yeah. For certain yeah, yeah, and yeah. Like yeah. Where you just don't have to stand very. Yeah. Uh, I just wonder why no one else has done that. Right, it's right. So it's a connector that, that we develop in-house, right? So we own the IP. And I'm not quite sure how we go about it. I think, I think there should be ways of, like, how you go and tap into this. This would be a great thing to follow up with, with some of the uh, technical people here. Um, to figure out if you, you know, if you can go and if you can go and use it, but I, I would be surprised if you couldn't. Okay, one last question. <laughs> I was going to say LTE on the next Surface Pro. Um, we see it on I, the Surface, but are we going to see it on the Surface Pro? I don't know. <laughs> 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 uh, 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 uh,